Have you heard the good news? God loves you. And so do I. Second Chronicles, number 20, verses 15 through verse number 17. And he said, meaning God, said, Listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but whose? But God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Oh, that's shouting scripture. That's good news. Let's give, that's, that's good news scripture. A, a word. Put your name on that word. Take that word and put it on your mirror. Crochet it on a pillow. Be still and know that I am God. Is that right? What scripture is that? Can anyone tell me where that's found? Be still and know that I am God. Where is that found? Who said that? Where? Psalm 46 and 10. Be still and know that that should be somebody's scripture. Somebody should have that like yelling it out. Be still and know that I am God. That's a memory verse. Be still and know that I am God. What's our options to not be still, to be worried, to be anxious, to be concerned, to to be troubled in whatever situation? Be comforted by the words of God. Be still and know that I am God. Canaan, who's 10 years old, 10, right? Yeah. When Canaan was smaller, the kids used to pick on him. That's terrible. Big kids picking on their little baby brother. And he would come in. He'd be swimming in the pool. He'd say, and dad, and they come in, and I got out of the pool, and I got out, and I, was, I went into the bathroom, and I dried off because you said not to go in where we're wet. And then I went into the boys, and they were saying, and, and he's going through all of this because they took his goggles. But in the midst of this, as he's doing it, and then he did this, he said, wait a minute, just calm down. And he starts all over again. I got out of the pool, and I went in. I said, no, just, but, but after that, no, after that, they took his goggles. All of this stuff was on his agenda, but my agenda was him. You see, we come to God with our agenda, but what's on God's agenda? is you. Be still and know that I am God. You're God's priority. You may have all kind of things that's your priority, things that you want to do this week and you want to accomplish today, but your priority is different than God's priority. God's priority has one thing on it and that's you. You're that that important to God. You mean that much to God. Be still and know that I am God. God's saying to us sometimes, I've already taken care of that. Right now, my concern is you. And if you knew like God knew, he's established the end at the beginning. That means whatever you cannot see, God already has established order. So you're walking into a blessing. What may appear to be evil on one side, God will turn it around and make it a blessing in your favor. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes God will allow blessing to happen so that we can see it in the midst. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we battle not against what? Flesh and blood. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers in the darkness and heavenly places. That means that while you're sleeping, and because you're a child of God and you're ordered by his steps, God is battling in the heavenlies on your behalf. The disease that wanted to get to you could not get to you because God battled it on your behalf. The bankruptcy, God ordered it not to happen. Your health was in order because God established it in the heavenlies. There are blessings that's being set in order in the heavenlies that you'll never understand that while you're resting, God is taking care of your family and your friends and your workplace and your job situations. Be still and know that I am God. 
But sometimes God may allow something to happen in low places and God allow you to see a battle where you're outnumbered, you're outgunned, you're doomed. God, I don't know how this is going to work. But God is saying, just as in the heavenly realm, you didn't know things were happening, I want you to know right now that this is already taken care of. He says, be still and know what? That I am God, number one. Look at number one on your programs, number one. Don't give up. Praise up. I like that. Say that with me. Don't give up. Praise up. In Judges chapter number one, verse number one and two, this is after Joshua had died. And throughout Deuteronomy and leading into Joshua, God was telling the people, be bold and be courageous. Be bold and be very courageous. The one thing that he did not want them to lose was their praise. The saddest thing that happens when we lose our praise, when we allow situations and circumstances in our lives to surrender our praise. Nothing can take away anything from you that God has ordered. We surrender it. Be still and know that I am God. Nothing can steal your joy. S-T-E-A-L. But some things can S-T-I-L-L can cause your joy to cease. Don't allow the trouble, the mishaps, the causes, the concerns of your life to steal your praise. When things are down, praise up. Praise yourself up. So when they got to go into battle, they were asking God in Judges chapter number one. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord saying, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. As you know, Judah means praise. When you're facing overwhelming odds and you're prepared for battle. And in this situation, they had three armies that were set against Jehoshaphat, three armies against them. Who shall we send? Let's send praise. Let's send praise ahead of those. And the next morning, Jehoshaphat got his singers, kind of like the New Life singers. He set those ahead. And they didn't have on armor. They didn't have swords or spears or battle gear. They were armed with praise. And when they set them up front, what kind of strategy is this? They're not prepared for battle. What are they doing out there? How is that going to work? But they were prepared with the most potent weapon that they needed, and that was praise. When they led with praise, nothing but praise, led the, led the procession, proceeding with praise. Here's what happened in, in chapter 20, verse 22. As soon as they started doing what? Shouting and praising. You see that? Wrong verse. Next one. Second Chronicles 20 and 22. As soon as they started shouting and praising, God set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir as they were attacking Judah, and they all ended up dead. As soon as they started shouting and praising, the table for victory was set by their praise. God was waiting for them to start shouting and praising. What if they hadn't shouted or praised? What if they thought that it didn't make sense to praise God at a time like this? And sometimes we're in a situation, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel good. I don't feel like praising him. But God is waiting to set things in order for you to start shouting and giving God praise and glory. And as they began to shout and praise, God set ambushes so that the enemy began to attack themselves. This didn't make any sense. They didn't come to attack each other. But God would disturb the enemy and cause order and position and change to happen according to his command. And what did Jehoshaphat and his armies do? They just sit there and say, they must have lost their mind. They're killing each other out there. Huh? They're killing each other. What? Hold on, wait a minute. I, this, I think this is over. Yeah, a few more. Oh, well, okay. And they went and they got the spoils because the battle was not their battle. 
You fought battles in your life that weren't your battle before because you didn't wait on God. Are we impatient like that sometimes? Because God doesn't move in our time frame. And when he doesn't move, we have a prayer, we pray, and there's expiration date on our prayer. Right? We pray with expiration dates, and if God doesn't move within our expiration date, then we say, okay, it's not God's will. That's how we do it. It's not God's will, so let me step out and let me just do what I need to do because I need to handle this. Be still and do what? And know that I am God. No pretense was in their praise. This was honest and without reservation. And sometimes we can have pretense and come into church. We can have pretense in our praise. We can have pretense, which means that we, we do this because we're expecting and hoping that God's going to honor what you do. So I'm going to come and I'm going to praise God because I need something on Tuesday. I'm coming to church this month because next month some things I'm hoping and praying and believing God for. That means there's pretense in your praise. There should be no pretense. You should be free to just worship and praise God. Amen. Doesn't matter who's around or who's witnessing to you or what, what it looks like or what it feels like. You just feel like praising and giving God glory and adoration. Number two, number two, trusting God always involves patience. In Genesis number 18, verse 13 and 14, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? So at 75 years of age, God told Abraham, you shall be the father of many nations. Your descendants shall be like the sands of the seashore. At 75. Now, Abraham believed God, but he was past childbearing age and Sarah was 65. So this had to be an act of God. He believed God, and, and, and five years passed by, and no child, and 10 years passed by, and no child. After a while, Sarah says, look, hold on, wait, wait. <laughs> Maybe God means you and not me. Maybe he means that the child's going to come from you. And sometimes when we don't receive from God what we want, we start determining maybe God means something different. We change order. I believe God for this, but maybe this is what it is. I've done that. I've, I've wanted to purchase something. I've wanted something. And I had specific criteria for what I wanted. But when you don't start seeing it, it's not happening and according to how you want, you start compromising. Is that right? Well, maybe I don't need this option. Or maybe I don't need this. Maybe I can settle for this. God never called us to settle. Because when we start settling, we believe that either God can't do it, huh? we're, we're praying, believing God, we're hearing God, but then when it doesn't happen, we start doubting the same God that gave us the instruction. So maybe God's word is not true. Maybe this is too hard for God. And we start to have doubt and we start to settling for less than. And then when we get what we have settled for, we run and we all tell God, okay, God, I need you to fix this. Right? Amen. Just me? Am I the only one that's done that? <laughs> we get ourselves out there in trouble because we were not patient. Because God didn't move the way we wanted him to, and we moved ahead of God. So Abraham and Sarah, no children after 12 years, and she tells Abraham, maybe... God means you. And in fact, my handmaid, Hagar, maybe you can conceive and God will bless that union. And they conceived and a child, Ishmael, was born from the union of Hagar and Abraham. But God said, that's not the one. That's not the one. It's sad who we're into a situation and it's not the one. We jump ahead of God and it's not the one. When you're not patient and really believe in God, anyone will do. We get desperate. But when it's not the one, you've got to take ownership. And no, that's, this is not the one. This is not the job. This is not the person. This is not the situation. And it's difficult sometimes to part with something that's partially working. Yeah. Right? 
We start convincing ourselves, well, better to have a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing. No, sometimes it's better to have nothing. Raise both hands <laughs> and a <the> foot. <laughs> because we've settled for that little bit of something. I tell you, a little bit of something can wear you. It can cause you to age prematurely. Yeah. A little bit of something when it's just not right. When God gives you something, God gives it to you pressed down, shaken together and overflowing, he says. I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. Can somebody say amen to that? When you really believe God, God would do everything that he said in this word. Is there anything too hard for God? No. But Sarah laughed. You believe God can supply it, but does, do you believe God would do it for you? You've seen God do it for someone else, but will God do it for you? Sometimes you, your question is, do you deserve it? You ask yourself, do I deserve it? And we'll have everybody to pray for us because clearly God didn't hear my prayer. And we'll pray it again and again. Okay, God, I'm going to pray it again because apparently you didn't hear me the first three times. Okay, God, here's my need. Here's where, here's where I am, God. And then we'll call and ask someone who's closer to God than you are. I'm going to get, I know you're closer to God. I'm, in fact, I'm going to see a pastor will pray because I think pastor's closer to God than me. And clearly God will hear his prayer, my prayer plus pastor's prayer. If we all flood the lines going to God, huh? Text God at 345 God, and we're going to all flood. And if God, if only a prayer that God hears, okay, give it to him. Just give it to them, goodness, so I can get back to work. Will God just hear your prayer? Will he just hear your, your little prayer that you pray? Do you have to be eloquent when you pray? Oh God, according to the graces of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh God, thou art holy who comes down, who sought us out of Egypt and brought us from the land of bondage. It doesn't have to be anything special and you don't have to be perfect. Aren't you glad you don't have to be perfect? To, uh, you don't have to be perfect. In fact, God delights in imperfect people. I love it. God says, come as you are. Those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes. There's hope for the weary, the sinful, the downtrodden, the lost, the forsaken. No matter how far you think you are away from God, you're never out of touch. You're never out of reach. When nobody else wants you, God says, I'll take you. Yes, That's good news for someone who's hurt all their life that they're not worth anything and are struggling because of what someone else has said or things that have been done to know that all of that has been forgiven and God accepts you just as you are. Amen. Number three, be still and know that I am God. Number three, unwavering faith. Unwavering faith requires courage. Unwavering faith requires courage. A guy went to doctor for a checkup, could have a little hearing problem, quite elderly. The doctor says, I want you to return next week for the results. So he returns, he has this young woman on his arm. The doctor says, you seem to be doing pretty well for yourself. He says, doc, I just followed your advice. You said, get a hot mama and be cheerful. He says, no, I told you you have a heart murmur, be careful. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, how could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For their rock is not like our rock. I think that's, that's awesome. You should make note of these. These are good, this is good stuff. Their rock is not like our rock. Prudential has a rock, but it's not like our rock. Prudential has a piece of the rock, but we get the whole rock. It says, how could a one chase a thousand and two, 10,000 to flight? Anybody with math majors knows that one is to two, as two is to four, as four is to eight. So if one puts a thousand to flight, then two should be able to put 2,000 and three, 3,000 and four, 4,000. But that's not God's math. When you take courage, when you stand and you're courageous and bold and you're believing, you have faith, 
One will put a thousand to flight, but two will put 10,000 to flight because that's how God does it. When you are there, you and God is a majority. The majority is you and God. So no matter how many stands against you or what the odds are, know that you and God gives you victory. Amen. You are more than a conqueror. You are blessed and highly favored. Blessed going out and blessed coming in. Blessed in the city and blessed in the country. You go out in one direction, but you're blessed coming in another direction. You've got to make confession of those things. Those have to be scriptures and words that you live by. When something comes up, as far as a sword, the devil shoots one of those fiery darts after you. Something like a scripture should come up. But more than greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There should be a blessing that should come up. A scripture. Something should remind you of who you are and whose you are. And the God that is within you. When the priest brought the people out of captivity, at one point the people would, would do something. that They would abandon God and God would cause them to be captured. And take them to captivity. And when they were brought out of captivity, they loved the Lord. They adored God. But they were still stuck in their pagan ways. And God sent lions to devour the people. And then it says one of the priests needs to teach the people how to praise and how to worship. And the priests gathered the people around and began to assemble them and teach them how to praise and how to worship. And that's what I've done these last weeks over the last month teaching you again how to lift holy hands you remember that seven ways we talk about to praise God the shout the dance the music the hallelujah to, to, to yield yourself to God to bow down and then all of that together to heal and praise if you don't learn how to praise God then you'll miss the opportunity for your blessing because your blessing sometimes comes out of your praise your blessing is locked up in your praise. And if you can let your praise go, it releases your blessing. Amen. If we can just make it to the house of God, if I could just make it to, to Jesus, the woman that had an issue of blood had went to many physicians and she didn't grow, grow better, she got worse. But someone told her about Jesus. Yes. But she said, if I could just get to him, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get into the house of the Lord, if I can just get into his presence, everything else will be all right. And everything that she spoke on her way to Jesus was prophecy. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I will be made whole. You got to start speaking your, your destiny. If I could just get into the presence of God, I know that this situation is already done. And you enter in with your praise. Enter with thanksgiving and into his gates with praise. You come in lifting up the name of Jesus. Don't come in ex expecting something to lift you up. No, it's an inside situation. You've got to start praising from the inside. And God, let praise start to move you and, and allow it to release it. And before you know it's coming out of your mouth, then an amen and a shout. Then you're raising your hands and then you're standing up. That's what praise does to us. But it doesn't happen if we come and we expect to be moved into praise. It doesn't work that way with God. God waits. And as soon as we start to draw nearer to him, he begins to draw nearer to us. I don't feel like worshiping today. Woe is me. You've got situations in your life that makes you not feel like praising God. And we don't praise him because of the problems in our lives. No, we praise him because he has solutions. Satan's desire is for us to depend on human means. God desires for us to depend on him. Depend and trust wholly on him. And number four, we must have supreme confidence in God's promises. Yes. Hebrews number 10, verse 35 and 36. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Yes, I love this. Do not cast away your confidence. Your confidence is, is in God, in Jesus. I had a car, an Altima that I had for a number of years. I was driving this car one day, and the car just says, I quit. I called Walter and said, Walter, 
the car is dying. He says, can you get it to me? I said, I'm going to try. I drove, by the time I got there, every light in the car was on. The engine light was on, the oil pressure light, the, every light was on in the car. Even the light in the dome light came on. <laughs> we got there. I'm looking at this car, this car just like, bum, bum, bum. he raised the hood and Walter, if you don't know Walter, Walter sit there and he, and he looks over his glasses at you, like, what do you expect me to do with this? Anyway, he, <laughs> and the engine, was, the two of the engine blocks were missing, so the engine was like having a seizure, it was just, the car was just like having a seizure, just wobbling, and I say, what did he say, I just, just leave it here and I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll check it out. I went home and I told Kim, I said, baby, we got to get a new car. This car is dead. I, don't even, I know Walter looking at it, but I think this, this is over. And a few days later, Walter called me and said, well, it's ready. It's ready for what? <laughs> I got there, started the car, it ran like new. It's like, man, it's like a new car. Yes. What do you think that did to my confidence in Walter? About a month ago, Maya's driving that same car. The car just says, I quit. She calls me on the cell phone. Dad, the car died. So they tow it to a repair place. And the guy had already given the car last rights. The car is dead. She said, Dad, the, the car is dead. I said, yes. Let me call Walter. I got a guy. I say, Walter, they said that the car is dead. He says, well, can you get it to me? I said, Walter, I will do all I can to get it to you. Because if I could just get it to him. So Walter got there and he. <laughs> it didn't bother me this time. I left with confidence. Two days later, he says, you can come and get it. Wave your hand, Walter. Wave, wave your hand. So you know. <laughs> when people have counted you out and someone says to you that's over, give up. It's done. The enemy is all around you. Your prayer has not been answered. But you say, wait a minute, I've got, I've got a man. His name is Jesus. And if I could just get my situation to Jesus, if I can just, if I could just get to him. I remember where I was before and I came to him and he took care of situations in my life. And if I, can, if I can get this, I know what they'd say. I understand. I appreciate what you're saying. But if I could just get this over to Jesus, I know that everything is going to be all right. Don't worry. Be still and know that I am God. Don't worry about your situations. Be still and know that I am God. We have a, a problem sometimes believing that God is. That he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How diligent are we on Sunday morning to seek the Lord? How diligent are we during our week to seek out the Lord? Because when you know him, when you love him, no matter what your situation, no matter what your trouble a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. It's all the same to God. Be not dismayed. Be not afraid of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Say it with me. Be still and know that I am God. One more time. Be still and know. I am God. Father, we thank you for your word today.